You thought you could get rid of me, but nope. Here I am, in your houses, ready to talk about U.S. history. First, I want to say that I miss all of you greatly, and I wish more than anything else that we were doing this in person. Now, I'm going to encourage all of you to take notes like you might in class. If you were not a note taker, this could be a good time to start doing that. The great news about doing class this way is you do have the ability to pause me when you want me to shut up, and you can take a break for as long as you want. Remember, though, that this is the information that I would like to see as evidence on your tests when we take those in the weeks to come. Uh, before I start, though, I do want to give a very special shout out to, to my Block 2 homies, Josh and Travis, and Block 5's very own Jay Francis. <laughs> Guys, listen, I was trying really hard there. I wanted to come across as sincere and heartfelt, but as all of you know, uh, with these individuals, that's a little too difficult. And also, those guys know that I'm kind of kidding. Previously on this class, we talked about and read about the more positive, at least for some aspects of the 1920s. Was it a jazz age? Was it the Roaring Twenties? Flappers, the New Negro, Steamboat Willie, Charlie Chaplin, Radios, Vogue Magazine, Babe Ruth, and Alvin Shipwreck Kelly, who sat on top of a flag pole for weeks and got paid to do it. Today, we will turn our attention to the more negative side of the 1920s, one including uh, conflict over immigration and religion, the failures of prohibition, and a return to normalcy that ends in Great Depression. It's Chapter 24, The Reactionary 20s. At the opening of the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1924, R.T.H. Halsey, who up to this point was probably best known for fighting Teddy Roosevelt's efforts to fight bad trust when he was president of the United States, said, much of the America of today has lost sight of its traditions. Many of the, many of the people are not cognizant of our traditions and the principles for which our fathers struggled and died. The tremendous changes in the character of our nation and the influx of foreign ideas utterly at variance with those held by the men who gave us the Republic, threatened and unless checked, may shake the foundations of our Republic. Halsey's word and words embodied the idea of nativism that emerged in the 1920s. Now, nativism was not new in the 1920s. It, of course, has always existed. We've talked about it previously. But the nativism of the 1920s was different. The, this political cartoon from 1921 shows Uncle Sam's use of a funnel to control the flow of immigrants coming to the United States from Europe. This idea was seen in the legislation passed during the 1920s and even a few years before during the Wilson administration. Increased nationalism as Europe descended into war in 1914 ultimately led to increased nativism in the United States. The Immigration Act of 1917 was passed overwhelmingly by both houses of Congress. It included a literacy test. You can see the political cartoon there, which is from the time period. Um, the, the law also extended those prohibitions that had been part of the Chinese Exclusion Act to almost all of South and East Asia. It also created 30 classes of what the government called undesirables. Now, some of these groups had existed before, but this, group, this law dramatically increased that list. And again, you can see the list there. And again, they're in quotation marks. Those are words the government used. Those are not my words. Uh, the bill was ultimately vetoed by President Wilson, uh, but Congress, because of the nativist zeal of the day, ultimately were able to override it. At the end of World War I, there was a dramatic increase in immigration. In 1918, there were 110,000 immigrants who entered the United States. In 1920, there were 430,000. The month of October had 74,000 immigrants alone in 1920. Now, like in other periods of immigration that we've discussed in class, immigrants were viewed as competition for jobs. But during the 1920s, there was the element of the Red Scare, which is something that you would have read about at the end of World War I. Um, immigrants, especially those from Southern and Eastern Europe, were portrayed as radicals looking to start a revolution. The political cartoons from this time period were not very subtle. Yes, on the right, that is an immigrant with a bomb for a head. Steamship company officials told the government in 1920 that they could bring in 10 million immigrants a year. This caused alarm for nativists who would push Congress to act early in the 1920s. With the passage of immigration laws in the 1920s, Congress would dramatically change what immigration in the, to the United States looked like by creating nation-by-nation nation quota systems. 
The Emergency Immigration Act signed by President Harding in May 1921 put quotas, quota is basically think of it as a limit on something, on immigrants based on population figures. This is where you'll see the number 3%. If I'm being honest with you, the specifics of the bill are not as important here, but the results are. The law cut immigration from Yugoslavia by 74%. It cut immigrants from Italy by 84%. In 1921, right before the law was passed, there had been 28,503 Greek immigrants entering the United States. In the year after the law, there were 3,457. If you notice the political cartoon there, yes, that is the devil painting a, painting a picture of a communist in the color red. Like I said, not very subtle. Those behind the Emergency Immigration Act sought to lessen the number of immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. The National Origin Act, signed by the unexpected president, Calvin Coolidge, in 1924, sought to further limit immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe by changing the formula used in the Emergency Immigration Act. Again, the nativist math problem used is not nearly as important as the results. While dramatically decreasing the number of immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, it banned all immigrants coming from East Asia. The headline you now see at the bottom of the screen uh, is from the New York Times on April 27, 1924. Remember when I showed you that cheesy melting pot video? Here, the New York Times says those days are over. Also during this time, the Secretary of Labor visited Ellis Island a place where I have previously told you 5,000 immigrants were processed a day in 1907. The Secretary of Labor described Ellis Island as a deserted village. The government also set a cap of 150,000 total immigrants by 1929. The goals of these quota systems and immigration laws was to end immigration from Asia and severely limit the admission of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, or those deemed to be from less worthy parts of Europe. One part of the immigration story that might surprise some of you is the treatment of immigrants coming from Mexico. Between 1890 and 1920, there were 1 1.5 million Mexicans who crossed the southern border. After the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, farmers turned to Japanese immigrants, but after the Gentlemen's Agreement in 1908, they recruited workers from Mexico to pick produce. Mexicans filled this need in the 1920s. While, the use, while there was a debate over immigration across the southern border during the 1920s, the Border Patrol was created in 1924, and the deportation of what came to be known as illegal aliens became U.S. policy at the time. The politics of Mexican immigration just did not reach the fever pitch that we will see in the 21st century. A second example of 1920s nativism is the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan reemerged in the 1950s. This version of the Klan did not limit itself to attacking African Americans like it did during Reconstruction. This one targeted Catholics and Jews as well as immigrants. The fact that Indiana had the largest number of members shows how the Klan had changed from a racist organization based in the South in the 1860s and 1870s to a nativist and still racist organization with a larger footprint in the United States in the 1920s. We had briefly discussed D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, which was screened at the White House by President Woodrow Wilson. The movie features the Ku Klux Klan as the protagonist. You see Uncle Sam leading the Klan there in that one image. The burning cross was a symbol of intimidation and very common during the 1920s. Imagine walking through the nation's capital and encountering a Ku Klux Klan parade. And the picture on the bottom left shows a child member of the Ku Klux Klan. Their base of support came from championing what they call traditional values, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, WASPs, calling for, in their words, 100% Americanism. The Klan had more than 4 million members at its peak in the 1920s and used violence and intimidation. It gained influence at the state and local levels of government through judges, sheriffs, state legislatures, six governors. There were, there were also three members of the United States Senate that were members of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Until its demise in 1925, the Ku Klux Klan served as another example of nativism in American society during the 1920s. For those that might be curious, that picture on the left is a group of Klansmen riding a Ferris wheel in Colorado in 1926. The final example of nativism we will discuss is the trial of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti.
The trial revolved around the robbery of two employees of a shoe company in South Braintree, Massachusetts in April 1920. Eyewitness accounts of those who did the shooting and how many men were associated with the robbery varied. Law enforcement, without evidence, decided that the culprits were Italian anarchists. The initial suspect was an, was an Italian man with radical sympathies who lived near where the, get the getaway car was abandoned. When his alibi checked out, two Italian men, Sacco and Vanzetti, as a result of their association with the, with the potential second suspect, were arrested. In their possession were loaded pistols and anarchist literature. In spite of there being no evidence connecting these men to the murder, Sacco and Vanzetti were charged with murder. Sacco and Vanzetti were among the 130,000 Italian immigrants who came to America in the year 1908. While their answers to police were not always truthful and there was no evidence that directly connected them to the crime scene, they were sentenced to death in 1921. With that being said, there have been a lot of people who have, who have expressed their thoughts on the case in the years since. Some who claim to know this and others who claim to know that. Some say that they were both guilty. Others say that Sacco was, Sacco was guilty and Vanzetti was not. To be honest, I'm not sure what happened to those shoe store employees and do not know what, if any, role Sacco and Vanzetti did or did not play. The one thing that this case that is clear to me is that the trial did not meet the standard anyone should expect in the United States. And the fact that these two men were Italian with ties to anarchist circles during the 1920s played a role in the way the trial was conducted and covered. The trial and sentence led to protests and rioting in places like Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Sydney, Berlin, Hamburg, Geneva, and Leipzig. Nine people were killed in Germany. The U.S. Embassy in Havana was bombed. American hotels, theaters showing American movies, and stores selling American goods were attacked by angry mobs in Paris, all over Sacco and Vanzetti. When all requests for a new trial and a pardon were denied, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed by electric chair on August 23, 1927. Another source of conflict in the 1920s was over religion. This conflict within the Protestant church pitted modernists against fundamentalists. Modernists thought that Christian teachings and modern science could go hand in hand. Religious fundamentalists believe in the strict literal interpretation of the Bible. These individuals viewed American society in the 1920s like the image seen here. As an inevitable descent from doubt to atheism, many people believed that the root cause of this spiritual decline was the teaching of Darwinian evolution in public schools. Tennessee, like many southern states, passed a law that banned the teaching of evolution in public schools. This law, the Butler Act, forbade the teaching of any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and teaches instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Enter John T. Scopes. Scopes was a substitute science teacher with the support of the American Civil Liberties Union, known as the ACLU, was arrested for teaching Darwin's theory of evolution in 1925. The goal was to test the Butler Act. Scopes would be represented by one of the most well-known defense attorneys in the United States, Clarence Darrow. William Jennings Bryan, yes, the same William Jennings Bryan who gave the Cross of Gold speech, became the populist champion, ran and lost in his three attempts to become president, and quit his job of Secretary of State when he believed that Woodrow Wilson's language towards Germany was too aggressive in the wake of the sinking of the Lusitania. By 1925, Bryan was a leading religious fundamentalist and would prosecute the case against John Scopes. The trial was a circus. The small town of Dayton, Tennessee was inundated with people. There were more than a hundred newspaper and radio reporters. The trial was moved outside onto the lawn of the courthouse. Brian testified as an expert witness on biblical interpretation and did not hold up well under questions from Darrow. The judge instructed jurors that the only question that they needed to address was whether John Scopes taught evolution. After nine minutes of deliberation, they found him guilty. This debate from the 1920s between modernists and fundamentalists is still going on almost a hundred years later. During the Progressive Era, the 18th Amendment was passed and ratified. We have been talking about movements to ban alcohol going all the way back to the Second Great Awakening. During the First World War, temperance was viewed as a patriotic movement to help the war effort. The Volstead Act was the vehicle used to enforce the 18th Amendment, and it can only be described as an epic failure. Trying to get people to give up drinking proved to be an impossibility. 
It led to Americans violating the law through bootlegging and establishing speakeasies. There were many loopholes in the amendment, including the fact that it did not actually say that consuming alcohol was illegal. Only the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors. Individuals could keep and consume any alcohol owned on the day before the amendment went into effect. People stocked up. Farmers preserved their fruits by turning them into hard cider and wine. Doctors wrote prescriptions for medicinal Jim Beam. There were 700 million gallons of beer brewed in the United States in 1929 alone. The law cost the federal government revenue collected from the sale of alcohol and cost many of their jobs. Without adequate funding to enforce the law, organized crime thrived. Al Capone made more than $50 million a year. In the 1920s, bootlegging and basically had an armed militia that was responsible for some 300 murders in Chicago, none of which were solved. Capone would eventually go to prison for tax evasion. It was almost as easy to find a drink in America under prohibition as it had been before. Warren G. Harding served alcohol in the White House. How did Warren G. Harding get to the White House, you ask? We will discuss that right after this. And here are a few things I just thought you needed to know. The Eisenhower interstate system requires that one mile in every five must be straight. These straight sections are usable as airstrips in times of war or other emergencies. Well, that's the exit you take to get to my house. I'm going to take that off the screen now. Pretend like you didn't see that. Ancient Egyptians shaved off their eyebrows to mourn the death of their cats. Well, you know my feelings on cats. The cat just currently jumped up on the desk and I'm currently looking at it. Uh, if you don't get communist cat jokes. I can't help you. Maybe you weren't paying attention in Ms. Wallace's class last year. Also, in Egypt, they mummified their cats. This is a picture from the museum in London where they have a ton of ancient Egyptian artifacts, including cat mummies. And lastly, there is a town in Texas called Ding Dong. Can you imagine being from a town called Ding Dong? If you were from a town called Ding Dong, would you admit to being from Ding Dong? The kid from Ding Dong will never be elected president of the United States. Bill Clinton was the boy from Hope, right? He was born in Hope, Arkansas. When he ran for president, those ads ran them, you know, they wrote themselves. How can you be taken seriously if you're from Ding Dong? Saying Ding Dong over and over again is a little awkward for me. It's a little less awkward without you all staring at me. So I can just keep saying Ding Dong. Okay, but imagine, imagine being like the kid from Ding Dong. Imagine being... I don't know, what's a random example? Jay Francis of Ding Dong. No one would take that kid seriously. Well, they probably don't take him seriously anyways, even if he was, I don't know, from you know, Gainesville or something. In the election of 1920, Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding defeated progressive reformer and governor of Ohio, James Cox, and his relatively unknown running mate, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Harding's victory ushered in an era of conservatism that marked an end of Wilsonian idealism and internationalism, along with the progressivism of the Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson presidencies. Harding offered few ideas, but promised a return to normalcy. The 1920s was dominated by Republican control of Congress and the White House. Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover would preside over a period of dramatic economic growth until the bottom fell out in 1929. The Republicans of the 1920s led the federal government back to the style of leadership we saw in the Gilded Age. Republicans focused on policies that benefited business, including cutting taxes, cutting government spending, increasing tariffs, and supporting regulation that benefited business. Increased tariff rates have been a major Republican belief up to this point, and these presidents were no different. The 1922 Ford and McCumber tariff increased tariff rates from the lowered rates under the Wilson Underwood Simmons tariff. The Re Revenue Act of 1926 cut estate taxes and got rid of what was called the gift tax. These Republicans were much closer to Rutherford B. Hayes and Benjamin Harrison than they were to Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Harding led a short presidency, one defined mostly by scandal. He did appoint some individuals many thought were the best minds in the party who proved to do their jobs efficiently. Andrew Mellon was the third wealthiest man in America after Rockefeller and Henry Ford. I emphasize man there because he was actually the fourth richest person in America, as Henry Ford's wife Clara was the third richest person at the time. 
Former President William Howard Taft became the only person to serve as president and as a member of the Supreme Court when he was appointed Chief Justice by Harding. While focusing on dismantling many social programs from the progressive era, Harding did criticize the KKK and called for an anti-lynching law and pardoned Eugene Debs for violating the Sedition Act during World War I. But the Harding administration was marked by scandal, starting with Nan Britton, who published a book about her relationship with Harding in 1927, four years after Harding's death. In the book, she claimed that Harding had fathered her child a year before he was elected president. The book also talks about Britain and the president having sex in a White House closet. Before there was Bill Clinton, there was Warren G. Harding. Britain insisted until her death that Harding was the father. A DNA test in 2015 confirmed that Harding was, in fact, the father of her child. The Harding presidency was close to Ulysses S. Grant's on the scandal front. I mentioned some of the best minds of the Republican Party a few moments ago. Albert Fall and Harry Doherty did not fall into that category. The Teapot Dome scandal was a major scandal during the Harding presidency. It involved the leasing of land in Wyoming to oil companies for bribes collected by the Secretary of the Interior, and then the Attorney General accepting bribes to look the other way. Harding would die of a heart attack in 1923, and his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, would become the 30th president of the United States. Calvin Coolidge is maybe best known in modern politics as Ronald Reagan's favorite president. At the time, he was best known as the governor of Massachusetts who broke up the police strike in 1919. Coolidge believed that the government should not interfere in the economy and was determined to be an inactive president. The Wall Street Journal said of the Coolidge presidency, never before here or anywhere else has a government been so completely fused with business. This political cartoon is a good representation of the Coolidge presidency. His line, the chief business of the American people is business, could serve as a motto for the presidents of the 1920s. Coolidge was easily elected in 1924 as a result of the economy. As president, Coolidge vetoed 50 bills, which is the ninth most by any president. Only Grant, Cleveland, and Roosevelt had more vetoes at the time of his presidency. He vetoed the mcnary Hogan Act, which was designed to help raise the prices of farm commodities as farmers started to struggle even before the Great Depression began. He also vetoed bonuses to be paid to World War I veterans. The issue of bonuses for World War I veterans will become a much bigger issue during the Hoover administration. These are some of my favorite Coolidge pictures, as most of the time you see him wearing a regular suit. In the top picture, Coolidge shows why politicians should never put things on their heads when he was made a member of the Sioux tribe in 1927. The bottom left picture shows Coolidge on his way to the dedication of Mount Rushmore. And the final image is Coolidge in a cowboy outfit gifted to him by the state of South Dakota while vacationing there in 1927. It was on this trip to South Dakota that the president demonstrated why he was nicknamed Silent Cow. Coolidge summoned the press for a special announcement at noon. Coolidge then handed each reporter a strip of paper that said, I do not choose to run for president in 1928. Coolidge asked, is everyone here now? And answered no when asked if he wished to comment. Everyone was surprised, even his wife. That was the end of the press conference. The election of 1928 pitted Republican Herbert Hoover, who had served under the last three presidents and was a self-made millionaire working as an architect, against Democrat Al Smith. Smith was the governor of New York and was a Catholic. He was the first Catholic to be nominated by a major political party for president. There have only been two Catholic nominees since, John F. Kennedy in 1960, the only Catholic U.S. president, and John Kerry, who lost to President Bush in 2004. Hoover won easily with, with the promise to continue what was called the Coolidge Prosperity. I am a big fan of political buttons. This one is one of the worst. Am I the only one who does not get it? Owls are intelligent? I have no idea what it means. When running for president in 1928, Herbert Hoover said, We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. The poorhouse is vanishing from among us. We have not yet reached the goal, but given a chance to go forward with the policies of the last eight years, and we shall soon, with the help of God, be in the sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this nation. And less than a year later, the stock market crashed. 
throughout the 1920s, the stock market could not miss. People took loans to invest money in the market as it seemed like it was a sure thing. On Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, almost eight months into the Hoover administration, the market crashed. We have discussed many economic panics in this class. There were the panics of 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, and 1893. There was one we did not really discuss in 1907. A chart of the U.S. economy looks like a roller coaster. The 1920s was a long ride up but the Great Depression was the biggest drop that the United States had ever seen. It would impact more Americans and last longer than any economic downturn before or after. The causes of the Great Depression were rooted in the economy of the 1920s. Throughout the 1920s, while the rich might have gotten richer, more Americans moved closer to the poverty line as the cost of living continued to increase and wages could not keep up. As this happened, the gap between rich and poor continued to grow. Speculation in the market by not only individuals, but banks also played a role. As customers took out more loans, the banks were poor stewards of the people's money, money that banks probably should not have been lending out in the first place. The credit that we discussed in Chapter 23 was another issue. With credit so easy to claim, many Americans borrowed well beyond their means to buy the new consumer goods that debuted in the 1920s. This was also true for farmers and homeowners. The American economy lacked diversity by the end of the 1920s, with automobiles and construction accounting for a disproportionate percentage of the overall economy. The lack of government action also played a role. We will discuss the Hoover response next time, but the laissez-faire potluck policies of the 1920s allowed for many of these issues to take place without any government oversight. Globalism was another cause, as the United States was linked to the economies of Europe as a result of billions of dollars lent during World War I. When the United States wanted their money back, the Europeans did not have it. In April 1930, the president proclaimed that the depression is over. It was not. The effects of the Great Depression were felt in every part of the country. Thousands of banks closed with customers losing billions of dollars. When a bank closed at this time, your money was gone. It was not coming back. There was nothing protecting your money. Gross national product decreased by almost half. The average American income did increase by half and unemployment peaked at 25% in 1933. This is the highest unemployment rate in American history by a lot. Unemployment would remain over 14% until 1941. To understand how high this is, the U.S. unemployment rate has only topped 10% once since 1940. It was 10.8% in 1982. In October 1930, the president said, I am convinced we have passed the worst, and with continued effort, we should rapidly recover. They had not. The Federal Reserve's decision to increase interest rates and decrease the money supply did nothing but force more small banks and their depositors into bankruptcy. The marriage and birth rate both declined during the Great Depression. This was not the optimal time for many to start one's new life with someone else or to bring new life into the world. There were signs of desperation everywhere, a man in a suit trying to get $100 for his car, having lost all of his money in the stock market, another man in a suit trying to earn money selling apples, soup kitchens and bread lines were long, and many Americans lost their homes. In October 1930, the president also said, the fundamental business of the country, that is, production and distribution of commodities, is on sound basis. It was not. At the start of the Great Depression, farm incomes decreased by 60% and a third of farmers lost their land. To make matters worse, there was one of the worst droughts in American history that would last a decade. The area from Texas into the Dakotas came to be known as the Dust Bowl. There were dust storms known as black blizzards that blocked the sun and suffocated livestock. Any food that was able to be grown could not find Americans able to afford it, so farm prices plummeted. Hundreds of thousands of families left the Dust Bowl for California and other states in hopes of finding a better situation. Oftentimes, they were not much better. Let's close the show with a quick look at 1930s culture. Movies and radio provided potential distractions from the day-to-day -day misery millions of Americans experienced during the Great Depression. If one could still afford a radio or afford a ticket to the movies. 
For those that could, they could experience popular radio shows like Superman and Lone Ranger. They could listen to the World Series or the Academy Awards, which was first broadcasted in, the, in 1930, the second year the awards were given out. For those going to the movies, they could see The Wizard of Oz, Disney's first full-length animated movie, Snow White, John Steinbeck's famous novel-turned-film, The Grapes of Wrath, which highlighted the experience of Okies going to California trying to change their luck during the Great Depression. There was also my mother's favorite, Gone with the Wind. That's all for now. Next time, we will look at Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt's very different responses to the Great Depression. Luke and Leah, say goodbye to these good people. Goodbye. Bye. Tell Jay Francis that you exist. We exist. We exist. Good night, Albuquerque.